we proceed any further, might I get a little order in this house so that we can hear the questions? It's all very well. There's a great deal of barracking going on on my right as well as my left. And I would like to hear less of it from now on. We come now to questions to the Prime Minister, to Jakes Arnold. Question. Go on, madam. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall be having further meetings later today. Mr Jakes Arnold. Bearing in, my, bearing in mind my right honourable friend's commitment to put Britain first, <laughs> would he confirm to the House the priority that this government gives to getting this country out of recession and to the creation of jobs? Yeah. Madam Speaker, all across, all across Europe and beyond, economic circumstances are very difficult and have noticeably worsened in a number of countries in recent months. We are seeking the right policies that will bring back not just recovery to this country, but recovery with low inflation. I believe the reductions we've been able to make in interest rates and the increasing competitiveness of the exchange rate will enable us to lead this country back to the recovery with low inflation and sustained growth that we need. I'm grateful, Madam Speaker. In the light of the statement made by the President of the Bundesbank, and in the light of the statement made by the Chairman of the Italian Central Bank, that there was a general realignment available yes. to the British yeah. government prior to Black Wednesday, can the Prime Minister now answer the question which his Chancellor failed to answer before the Select Committee, but which he has not answered from that dispatch box? Was there or was there not a general realignment on the table, either formal or informal? Yeah. 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 I am happy to answer that categorically, Madam Speaker. No, there was not, neither formal nor informal. Yeah. 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 Mr. Robert Adley. That's number two, Madam Speaker. I refer my honourable friend to the answer I gave a few moments ago. Mr. Adley. Referring to the matters which are on the mind of the House, does my right honourable friend accept that there is some linkage between the privatisation of electricity and the current problems in the coal industry? Is he aware that I've heard from British Rail this morning that if the uh, proposals, <laughs> if the pit proposals were to go through, they would, in terms of lost revenue and redundancies, face a bill in excess of two hundred million pounds. Will my right honourable friend therefore please give us a clear assurance today that if there are to be any further privatisations, either of industry or of the nation's transport infrastructure, a full cost-benefit analysis will be provided to the House so that, we can assess, so that we can assess the full national implications of these proposals. May I say to my honourable friend, Many of the problems faced by the coal industry, those faced at present and those faced after many, uh, over many years, preceded privatisation and have far more to do with the demand for coal and the changing market in energy that exists in this country. It is for that reason that it is not only in this country that there has been a severe contraction of the coal industry. It is true in France. It is true in Belgium. It is happening also in Germany and elsewhere. On the specific question of the railways that my honourable friend raised a moment ago, the white paper published in July was preceded by a great deal of thought, discussion and consultation inside government, and consultation continues on all matters. Mr Paddy Ashdown. But, Madam Speaker, is not the proposition which the government is now asking its backbenchers to accept not simply this, that having been found out seeking to close down the coal industry quickly by rigging the market, it now asks to be allowed to close down the coal industry slowly by rigging a review. Is, not, is that not what they're being asked to swallow? No, no sir. That is, that is not either an accurate or reflection of the policy that the government are following, and that was made perfectly clear in my right honourable friend's statement yesterday. No one doubts and no one has disputed that over many years, over all governments, there has been a continuing and severe contraction of the coal industry for reasons that were unavoidable. The circumstances that the government now faces is that even at the existing prices for coal, which we are now aware will be noticeably smaller and lower in future, 
that there is a market that is contracting and there are coal stocks that are growing daily. That is a problem that the government cannot ignore. The sooner the government deal with that problem, the sooner we will comprehensively be able to put in place the sort of assistance measures that will, that will provide alternative employment and alternative security in areas where people know the existing jobs have at best only a limited life. Dr Robert Spink. Thank you. Number three, Madam Speaker. I refer my honourable friend to the answer I gave a few moments ago. Dr Spink. Will the Prime Minister join me in welcoming the 1% cut in interest rates on Friday? Yeah. That, will, oh yes. yeah. that will do so much to help all the people who have to pay mortgages in this country That's and right. to help businesses That's in this country, right. businesses large and small. And will the Prime Minister agree with me that the key to resolving our difficulties with unemployment and to taking us out of the teeth of the world recession, the key is low inflation, and we're achieving that. Madam Speaker, we have now, we have now achieved a level of low inflation, both in terms of the retail price index and underlying inflation, at a level we haven't seen for very many years. It is undoubtedly helpful for British industry that it's been possible to reduce interest rates to 8%, and I was particularly pleased to see the consequential mortgage reductions that have been announced today. But what we do need to bear in mind, as my honourable friend indicated, that it is not simply a question of interest rates at a low level. It is also vitally important for our future prosperity to restrain any reinflationary surge that may follow. And my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has made it clear that keeping inflation low one of the essential ingredients for sustained encourage, uh, encouragement of jobs, prosperity and growth remains central to the government's policy. Yeah. Mr John Smith. Yeah. Madam Speaker, since it is crystal clear that yesterday, whatever else he did, the President of the Board of Trade did not announce a review of the pit closure programme, will the Prime Minister now agree to establish a genuine and independent review before any pit is closed forever. Let me, let me make clear, so there is no dispute or misunderstanding anywhere in the House of the position both of the uh, ten pits and of the remaining pits that were mentioned in my right honourable friend's statement yesterday. The ten pits that he specifically named, in our judgment, have no sustainable economic future, but they will go through the full statutory review procedure. But during the moratorium on the other pits, the Trade and Industry Select Committee, I have no doubt, will wish to hold their own inquiry and the government will give that their fullest cooperation. During the moratorium, the President of the Board of Trade will himself take views and evidence to consider alongside the information already available to him. In due course, on all matters, in due course, he will publish that in time for consideration by this House before any future debate in the House of Commons, and his statement will be set in the context of the government's energy policy and will set out the consequences of that policy for British coal, the implications for individual pits and the employment prospects for the industry. It is after that debate that future decisions will be taken. Yeah. John Smith. Could I remind the Prime Minister of the question I asked him? which was whether he would establish a genuine and independent review. If, if, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, if the Prime Minister really believes he has a strong case, what has he to lose from an independent inquiry? What is he afraid of? Well, let me refer the right honourable gentleman to the answer I gave. When we have... When we have completed the consultation and the examination, which I repeat will be made public, and I repeat also will be laid before this House, there will be every opportunity for every view to be taken into account before matters proceed. John Smith. But Madam Speaker, is it not now clear that the only satisfactory alternative to constantly shifting statements from the Prime Minister and the President of the... Um, of the Board of Trade and, and 
to the unseemly ducks auction which is going on amongst backbenchers opposite is for this House tomorrow night to vote to refer the whole matter to our own select committee and for that to be the responsibility of members in all parts of the House. Well, uh, it is now clear, Madam Speaker, that the Right Honourable Gentleman was not listening, for I said it was an assumption of the Government that the Trade and Select Committee would wish to consider this matter and that we would, then that we would provide whatever evidence was necessary to this Committee. But I must say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, notwithstanding the tremendous emotions that have, been, that, that have arisen about this whole affair, I must say it is bogus of him not to recall the vast number of mines that have been closed by his government, the large number of miners put out of work by his government, and the activities of his government in recent years that played a significant part in reducing employment in the mining industry from 700,000 down to the present level. Patrick McNeil. Madam Speaker, is my right honourable friend aware that the concern being expressed about the closure programme is very much bound up with a wider concern about the direction of our economy post ERM? And would he not agree with me that with a lower value for sterling, it really is essential that we have a policy of import substitution, of buy British, not building gas-fired power stations when we've already got 50 per cent too much gas uh, generating capacity? If he were to put those facts into the review, then he would find the enthusiastic support of people like myself who are deeply concerned with what is being proposed. Well, I agree entirely with my honourable friend that the changing level of the exchange rate offers the most remarkable opportunities for British exporters and also offers a better incentive than we have seen for many years for the possibility of import substitution. But I think my honourable friend also does need to bear in mind that we are by instinct a trading nation and we must bear that in mind in all the policies that we follow. But as I made clear a few moments ago, what the government are seeking to do and will continue to do in the period up to and including the public expenditure round is looking at the difficulties that are faced in this economy and looking at the right possibilities and the right policies to build on present economic circumstances a proper level of growth for the British economy and for British industry. Mr Andrew Smith. Number four, Madam Speaker. I refer the honourable gentleman to the answer I gave a few moments ago. Smith. Can the Prime Minister understand that it is my right honourable friend who has spoken for Britain? Yeah. And can he and can he name can he name one independent expert prepared to say that gas will produce cheaper electricity than coal. The President of the Board of Trade couldn't name one yesterday. Will he'll, he name one this afternoon, yeah. yes or no? If that were not the case, perhaps the Honourable Gentleman could explain to the House, can explain to the House why the demand for gas amongst consumers across this country is rising dramatically and shows signs of rising even further. Thank you. In spite of all of the difficulties being faced at this moment by this country and other countries in the world, could the Prime Minister give the House and the nation reassurance that we will continue our efforts to aid those countries in the developing world which suffer even greater difficulties than we do? Well, Madam Speaker, I think we have a very proud record indeed in that respect. Both both in terms of the quantum of aid that we provide, in terms of the quality of aid that we provide, and also in terms of keeping open markets in this country for their exports, which in many ways is the greatest assistance that we can actually provide to the developing world. In the statement I shall make in a few moments on the European Council, I will also set out some extra help to other countries that face particular needs at present. Order, order. We have a statement from the Prime Minister.